So today we're just covering the last um, part of chapter 11, basically looking at ethical implications in mental health research. So what this entire topic is about is basically looking at this idea of when we've got patients who have mental disorders like depression or bipolar or schizophrenia or any mental disorder, or even when we've got patients who simply have heightened levels of anxiety, um, a lot of the time there is this kind of um, high level of interest um, in researchers, in psychologists, in therapists to research these people, to use these people in experiments or in research studies, because we want to figure out more about their mental processes, more about how they respond to certain types of medication, more about in general, how are they different? How is their functioning different to a person who doesn't have those mental health issues? So there is a lot of mental health research out there conducted on patients who have mental health issues and who are experiencing actual mental disorders. One of the problem that comes out of that, however, and that forms, which forms the basis of today's topic, is this idea of ethical issues. What are the ethical issues or the ethical implications around using patients or people who have actual mental disorders in mental, mental health research or experiments or research studies or research investigations that are trying to use them as participants, essentially? Okay, so the two main ethical implications that we're looking at today is the role of informed consent, basically asking ourselves the question of, can a person who has a mental disorder that stops them from thinking clearly, that stops them from being able to make proper decisions, can a person like that actually give informed consent? Okay, are they in a right state of mind to do that? And the second thing that we're looking at is the use of placebo treatments. Okay, so if you remember placebo um, from research methods, placebo is simply a fake drug. It's a treatment that doesn't have the active substance in it. Okay, so essentially, what is the impact of giving um, patients who have mental disorders placebos that essentially take the place of their real medication? And what is the ethical issues surrounding that, um, surrounding this idea? Okay, so let's just go straight into it and basically first look at informed consent. So before I show you um, the link between informed consent and mental health patients and mental health research, it's important for us to recap what is the definition of informed consent. So if we think back to research methods, informed consent is simply defined as you being able to give consent to um, basically give your permission to participate in a study um, after reading all the information that is um, required for you to make that informed decision. And remember we said that informed consent is not simply just signing your signature at the bottom of a page without reading the actual things that are at the top. It's about reading all the information and whatever's in this informed consent form will usually have all of these, um, these points here. Okay, all of these things with the ticks next to them. This is the information or the informed part of the informed consent. Okay, so essentially, um, we want to know the nature and the purpose of the study. We want to know any risks that are involved in the study. We want to know how is the study actually going to be set up? Is it going to be done over one day? Is it going to be done over a few period of months? Um, is it going to be, um, you know, is it going to be harmful for the participant? What are the outcomes that are going to come out of that study? And obviously telling the participants that you have the right to leave at any time without judgment or pressure to stay. So essentially, informed consent is about giving that participant all the specific details that they need about the study, um, making sure that when they do put their signature at the bottom of the page, they are making an informed decision, not a decision that's based on the fact that they're confused and they're just like, yeah, yeah, give me the paper, let me just sign it, I don't know what you're talking about. It should actually be an informed decision where they are 110% crystal clear on what the study is about and what their expectations are. So that's what informed consent is about, just as a recap. Now, how does informed consent become an ethical issue when we're dealing with mental health patients or patients with mental disorders? The problem with informed consent in mental health research, which is different from the way we use informed consent in other types of research when we're working with healthy patients, um, is that a lot of the time you've got specific mental disorders where there are issues with the way a person thinks and where a person's cognition or their ability to think and reason and make decisions is clearly affected, okay? And one of the reasons for this is obviously cognitive impairment. A lot of mental disorders, if you ever look at like the symptoms of certain mental disorders or the effects of certain mental disorders, you would notice that cognitive impairment is a major 
common factor for most mental disorders. Okay, whether you've got depression, if you've got an intense, um, very intense or severe um, form of depression there where you've experienced it many years, you might have a very big cognitive impairment in terms of you're not able to make decisions very quickly. Um, you're not able to think in a rational way. Or when you do think, you think in very negative or irrational or illogical ways. Okay, you can't have a patient who's got a really big cognitive impairment um, and, you know, giving informed consent where you're 110% sure that they're in the right state of mind or that they're using um, the maximum cognitive capacity there to give their consent. Okay, so obviously some mental disorders can lead to decreased memory. The participant might give you their consent and maybe a few days down the track, they're like, I don't remember ever even signing a consent form. What are you talking about? Okay, a lot of the time with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease that are neurodegenerative uh, mental-based disorders, these can actually occur. Um, deficits in decision-making can also be a problem. Thought processing. Okay, if you're dealing with a patient who has schizophrenia and they are delusional, um, they might actually think that they imagined the incident where they signed the consent form. They might not think that that was real and they start to blur their imagination with the reality which they went through. Okay, so essentially um, informed consent is difficult in mental health research because the cognitive abilities of the people that you're dealing with and those people's abilities to basically think clearly, make decisions that are quite confident, that are quite um, you know, informed, is actually very, very different and very poor compared to a person who doesn't have any form of mental disorder or mental health issue. Now, what can mental health patients do? Obviously, we can't just stop mental health research altogether. We still need to have participants that have depression. We need to be able to test on them. We need to be able to use them because we can't just um, have an idea of what depression is like without working with and involving people who have depression themselves. So in particular instances, and when we say particular instances, we're talking about extreme instances. This is not saying that every person with depression will be unable to give informed consent, but obviously the more severe cases might have difficulty giving that. Okay, if we're talking about severe cases where the participant definitely has a very um, pronounced cognitive impairment, then a parent, a carer, a guardian, even a mental health organization like the uh, psychologist, um, the psychologist that the person goes to, or the mental health organization that lo that's looking after that person or that patient. These people or these organizations can actually provide consent on the patient's behalf, okay? But like all other people, they are in no place, just because they've got some control there over the patient's consent, it doesn't mean that they can then pressure the patient to take part in the study. So if this is the patient that we're looking at in a study, okay, and um, you know, this is her psychologist who's gonna give consent on her behalf, and let's say I'm the experimenter doing this study on depressed patients and the role of some new antidepressant, um, I can't then whisper in, um, you know, this um, in her psychologist's ear and say, you know what, just like um, pressure her, tell her to, um, you know, take part in my study. She's the only option I have. I can't do that because then I am essentially um, pressuring the only dependent that this patient has to make a decision for her that is obviously not going to be informed, that is not even like an actual example of consent. And it's basically forcing the participant to take part, which then obviously also violates this idea of voluntary participation. Okay, so essentially that's what informed consent is about and that's why informed consent is a major issue when it comes to um, mental health research and an issue that we really need to tread upon quite lightly to avoid any kind of harm or any kind of way in which a patient could be taken advantage of or could be exploited. Okay, so that's essentially what informed consent is about. The next um, ethical implication that comes out of uh, mental health research is called the use of placebo treatments. Now, like we said before, when we were doing research methods, placebo basically refers to an inactive drug or a fake drug. So one example is that if I give two groups, um, if I'm trying to look at the effect of um, Nurofen or Panadol on um, pain relief, I could give the experimental group the actual Panadol that's got the 500 milligrams of paracetamol in it. Um, that's the active drug. And then the control group, I might give them a placebo, which is just like a little white, um, tasteless kind of pill. It doesn't taste like anything. It looks like an actual Panadol tablet, but it doesn't actually have any kind of 
active drug. There's zero paracetamol in that. There's no active drug in that. So essentially that becomes an inert or an active inactive or a fake drug, okay? That's what a placebo is. A placebo is um, a fake drug because it doesn't actually contain any active drug component in it. And a lot of the time, the reasons that we use placebos, very much for the same reasons we use control groups, are to act as a baseline for comparison. So we can compare the actual effect of the actual drug, the actual experimental treatment that we gave to the experimental group. So essentially, what, what we talk about when we talk about um, placebo is this idea that sometimes um, you could give a patient a drug that doesn't have anything in it, that doesn't have any active drug, but, but you give them that thing. And because they think it looks like a Panadol and it should be a Panadol, miraculously they start saying, oh, you know what, my headache's gone. But they actually didn't ingest any Panadol at all to begin with. So that's the placebo effect. And the placebo effect is when participants believe they've been given some kind of experimental treatment and they'll respond or behave differently to match their expectations. Okay, sometimes people say it's all in your mind. And with the case of placebo treatments, for some people, it can be all in their mind. Um, we use the double blind procedure to get rid of the experimental effect, but for the placebo effect, we use the single, I'm sorry, for the placebo effect, we use the single blind procedure. And that's when, um, you know, the participants don't know whether they've been given the experimental condition. Um, experimental treatment or the control treatment. Okay, so now let's try to link this to um, why are placebo treatments an issue um, in mental health research? And if they are an issue, then why do we still use them? Why are they still beneficial? So let's start with the reason of why they're beneficial. We still use placebo treatments in mental health research because sometimes it is good for human participants to use a placebo treatment rather than to use a actual new treatment that's coming out that we have barely tested. So to give you a really clear example of what that means, um, if I'm a researcher and I am investigating, you know, and I've, I've been involved in the development of some new kind of antidepressant that, um, new, some new kind of antidepressant that has less side effects than the current existing one, um, rather than giving that to the patient straight away, it's probably better for me to give a placebo treatment just to see the effect of that specific um, that specific medication or that specific um, you know new antidepressant. Now the problem with giving the placebo treatment, however, is that I can't just give the placebo treatment and still have the participant taking their existing medication because obviously the participant won't be able to pinpoint um, what is actually affecting their symptoms. So in order for one of my participants to take in the control group to take the placebo treatment, I have to tell them, you need to now stop taking all your current medication that you take for depression, put it to one side, lock it away for about six months and only take my placebo treatment. And because we know that placebo treatments are not actually proper medicines, okay, placebo treatments don't have any kind of, there's no active drug in them. So if I give my patient a, placebo for an antidepressant, it doesn't have any, any active drug in it that is going to act as an antidepressant. It's simply a placebo. And if I've asked my participant to then, um, you know, then basically um, throw away or just put to one side all their existing medicine, essentially what's going to happen is that their depression-related symptoms are going to become a lot more intense because they're not taking that normal medication that they take for a number of months that, that I've asked them to. Okay, and so essentially, what is the benefit of placebo treatments is actually kind of um, downplayed when you look at the risks, okay? There are more risks associated with making mental health patients take placebos and abandon their existing medication than there are benefits. So if we look at the risks of using placebo treatments, like I said before, the patients have to stop taking their active or real medication to take a placebo instead for the duration of the study. So that depends from study to study. Could be one month, could be two months, could be even three months. Obviously, when you are asking um, participants to stop taking their regular medication, um, what becomes a problem with that is that we can't expect that to happen for six months, okay? Generally, what happens in this case is if I am going to, um, you know, propose my study to the ethics committee and I tell them that, you know what, I'm doing a mental health study on 
the effectiveness of a new antidepressant and I'm going to make my patients take, um, you know, take a placebo for six months, they're going to be like, what? Automatically rejected. Like, we're not going to accept the study. Because that could obviously put participants in a lot of harm. That could lead to a lot of their um, depress depression symptoms coming back even more intense than they were before. And all the progress that they made in terms of managing their symptoms would basically be down the drain. So essentially when we do conduct studies with um, human patients and we ask them to take a placebo and abandon their existing medication, we can't do it for a long period of time because yes, um, it could be fatal for them, okay? Fatal in the sense that it doesn't physically harm them, but it might bring up all these thoughts in their heads increase their depressive symptoms. It could lead to a lot of self-harm. It could lead to suicidal tendencies and all that kind of stuff. So we have to be very careful with the kind of path that we thread, uh, tread when we are dealing with um, mental health patients. So like I said before, obviously, if you're making them stop taking their normal medication, they're not having the active drug in them for some period of time and their symptoms may reappear, or their mental health might actually become worse than it originally was. Okay, so we have to make sure that we are responsible in our use of placebo treatments when we do mental health research, okay? And we consider the severity of each patient's condition. Now, if you've got a patient one, so all right, P1, if you've got a patient one who, who has been experiencing severe depression, who has basically almost tried to commit suicide like about two or three times in the maybe 10 or 15 years that she's been living with depression, the worst thing for me to do would be then to tell her, you know what, you need to stop your active medication now. You need to take my placebo for the next two months. Okay, obviously that is going to have a very disastrous impact as compared to just asking someone who's just developed depression, patient two, who has very mild depression, who's only been experiencing it for about two or three months. It's better for me from an ethical point of view to use my placebo on patient number two because they are experiencing only mild symptoms and may experience less of a negative impact from taking the placebo and thus abandoning the active medication as compared to patient number one who was having a lot more of a severe and intense case of depression where taking a placebo might be enough to kind of put them over the edge, might be enough for their symptoms to become uh, potentially fatal or uh, potentially harmful enough that they might injure themselves or harm themselves. Okay, so that's what we mean by the responsible use of placebo treatments that we consider each individual patient's case before we decide who is going to take the placebo in my study and who is going to form the, essentially who's going to form the control group of my study. Okay, so we have to look at the actual individual participants there. Cool, so that basically, um, I think that is the last slide. Let me just have a look. Yep, that's the last slide. So um, yeah, that's basically it for chapter 11. So for the rest of, I'll just stop the recording here first.